Hey everyone, thanks for joining to our machine learning in single cell genomics seminar. I'm looking forward to welcoming a bunch of fantastic speakers today. Really looking forward to, to some of the um, Car Caro, uh, Nia, Micah, Louis. I think quite a cool spectrum. And I think it's a cool topic to really talk about uh, sort of at that time. Before uh, we go ahead with Carl's talk, let me just sort of give a, a bit of an overview. My name is Fabian Theis. I'm heading the Institute of Computational Biology at Helmholtz Munich, at the same time professor for biomass at the Technical University in Munich and associate fellow at the World Computer Trust Sanger in Hinkson in Cambridge, UK. And I'm interested in machine learning for, for sort of for, for a long time and been, I, I don't know when, when there was something like, yeah, like a long time ago started looking into single cell biology first and then single cell genomics, just from the pure motivation, hey, I wanna have high, high numbers to sort of deal with, not having to deal with the small and large P problem that we typically have at the time in normal transcriptomics analysis. And you know, this has changed. I think uh, we've been reaching in single cell genomics for sure this era of big data, if, if you want. I know it's a bit of a buzzword, but you know, I mean, here looking at you, Michael, you've been majorly contributing to us sort of being swamped in large scale uh, big data sets where you know we essentially can explore, but then also do all kinds of fantastically cool and fun, fun models on that. So I think you know when the first papers in uh, single cell RNA seq, and I've been looking that up as preparation for my short intro speech came around. I think this was like 2009. It was one of the most efficient nature papers ever, with I think five cells or something like that. And you know now we routinely do more than a hundred thousand or something like that. And you know big data, big power, you know means also big responsibility. Okay, yeah, that's a bit of a weak joke, but you know you get get the idea that we need to now do something with this data. And of course, big data, big data analytics, the, the tool at hand is machine learning. And, and I think in our case, what's kind of fun is that it's typically, uh, I mean, there's deep learning and other and, and graph learning about, but it's typically always unsupervised. So we don't have a particular specific phenotypic information about one cell. So we, you know, we try to learn landscapes and, and things like that. And I think understanding how then cells diverge from these dense spectrums. I think one of the first big machine learning fun problem was the super temporal orbit, right? So sort of finding one dimension to track this and going beyond that. So I think there's a whole bunch of cool machine learning problems that were spawned because of that type of question, but then also a bunch of cool answers onto real biology problems being done with machine learning tools. And I think the, 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 the four speakers we have today have a, a fantastic set of, of examples for doing so, and I'm really excited uh, to get started with that. So I won't be saying anything else. Oh no, I should say one more thing. So far, you know, this has all kinds of applications, sure in developmental biology, in immunology, but all kinds of very translational things as well from uh, trying to understand particular diseases on the cellular levels. In the end, most of the diseases happen on, on that level, right? To uh, maybe finding perturbations to sort of get the cells on healthy trajectory again. And, drug screens and so on. So I think uh, exciting area and we will surely hear a few examples along that line. So that was, that was my short intro speech. Now I'm very happy to get started with the actual seminar. And, uh, yeah, and, and finally, let me say, I'm, I'm thankful to both Hamholtz as well as Immunite to organize that and, and set it up. This is a, uh, I think I, I should say. Caro, Caroline Uhler, many of you have heard about her, but I will still, briefly say something about it. Caro, who has been recently joined as associate professor at MIT, as well as at the broad, but before that uh, being uh, visiting, and I think also assistant or, or something like that professor at, maybe associate professor at uh, uh, ETH. So been going through a, a, a few great places. And when I looked at the CV, actually, I didn't know that you've been at IST as well in, in Austria before. So there's a bunch of cool places in, in Europe where people do great things. Um, but in, in any case, I, I, I sort of first noticed Carl because she was really doing a lot of her uh, sort of uh, deep learning based exploration of latent spaces in combination with also causal inference and has been writing a, a bunch of very exciting papers along these lines. And I'm very excited to learn a bit more about maybe what she's currently thinking about. Carl, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Fabian, for this um, great introduction and to everyone here who is organizing um, for inviting me to speak here. Really excited to be here. Um, 
So let me just share. Okay, so let me just get started. I thought what I'll do here today is um, actually first start with a biological, with, with a lot of the biological uh, motivation for what we have been doing over recent years. Um, and this has really started with a long time collaboration which has been going on now for seven years or so with uh, Shiva's lab at ETH Zurich, um, who has really pioneered our understanding of how cell shape um, is actually um, related to and, and correlated with um, the gene expression in cells. And so how does that come about and why is that important? Well, if you think about how cells are in our body, well, they're very much, um, their, their shape is very much given by the microenvironment in which they're, they're sitting in. And so Shiva's lab has done all these really very careful experiments of how to change shape and then see how that actually changes gene expression um, through these kinds of micro patterning experiments that we see here. And so the question is, how can this work, right? How is this that, you know, shape of cells is actually um, so strongly associated with, with expression and in that, actually in a very predictable manner. And so here, and this has been really exciting from a computational perspective is that, um, that you know, what this intermediary is between cell shape and gene expression, um, and this is something that we've been looking into a lot is actually the packing of the DNA. So if you change the shape of cells, well, you're all just changing the shape of the cell nucleus where the DNA sits in, and that of course changes the packing of the DNA. And there's more and more evidence that of course, how the DNA is packed inside the cell nucleus will dictate very much how the genes are expressed, right? So if different genes come close in space and that can turn on very different um, downstream expression programs and say, for example, the transcription factor can turn on co-regulating genes that are now close in space that might not be close in space if you're in a different kinds of um, 3D organization of the DNA. And so this has been really exciting to us of like linking, you know, on one side, from a computational perspective, on one side, the, the shape of cells, um, which is given and formed by the microenvironment, then inside what that means for the packing of the DNA, and then again, what that means um, for actually gene expression. And so very interestingly, and why this is really important is that not only does you know, the shape also dictate uh, the expression programs that are turned on, but also if you have the same cells sitting on different shapes, and you give it the same signal, it will actually turn on very different downstream expression programs. And so that can really motivate the different kind of also on problems that we're currently working on, right? I'll talk a little bit more about this also later on. We all know that, you know, um, SARS-CoV-2 pathogenicity is highly aged extended. Now, the prevalent hypothesis is that this comes from the aging immune system, right? That this can be explained through the aging immune system. Now, um, in this paper here, uh, we provided together with Shiva, we provided an alternative or additional um, hypothesis of what could also lead to a similar kind of age-dependent uh, pathogenicity. Namely, uh, it is very well known that, you know, the aging lung is actually very different to the, to the young lung in terms of the stiffness of the cells. Um, so what does that mean and where does that come from? Well, so we have fibroblasts, right, and, and they make the matrix. And so um, these fibroblasts actually with aging, they become more and more dysfunctioning. And this leads to increased matrix deposition. And what is interesting, um, and this is also, again, very well known, is we have these epithelial cells, right, which are the, some of the first cells that get infected by SARS-CoV-2. And in fact, if these epithelial cells, if they sit on a stiff substrate or if they sit, sit on a very soft substrate, that actually changes their state. Um, and in particular, these epithelial cells on a stiff substrate, they actually become more mesenchymal. Now, why is this critical? Like she was lab, where he takes the same cells, put them onto a stiff substrate, so where they're more mesenchymal-like, or onto a relaxed substrate where they're more epithelial-like. And what you see here is that if you give it always the same signal, um, so in this, um, in this, um, you know, the signal is actually the same, basically the same signal as what they would see um, using based on a SARS-CoV-2 virus. So you give the same cells, they're just sitting on different kinds of substrates. So either they're more in the relaxed, um, sitting on a relaxed state where they're more epithelial-like or they're on a stiff substrate where they're more mesenchymal-like, give it the same signal and you'll see that they'll actually turn on different downstream expression programs. Now, um, why is this interesting? Well, this could also, um, and in fact, if you compare this to the kinds of genes that SARS-CoV-2 um, turns on, you'll actually see a whole lot of overlap. And so this kind of different kinds of expression programs that are turned on could be an alternative explanation of 
you know, why in very in, in aged individuals, we actually get a very different downstream, um, downstream kind of um, expression or age dependent um, response than in young individuals. And so I'll talk a little bit more about this, but this has been like a lot of what we have, uh, what has motivated many of the computational methods that we have been developing on really kind of linking, you know, packing of the DNA on one side um, with gene expression on the other side and seeing how this can lead to very different downstream expression programs when you have actually the same signal. Um, now I'll get to this question and I'll continue on the SARS-CoV-2 landscape, but I want to also tell you a little bit about the computational kinds of tools that we have been using um, and relate to some of the things that Propland has been saying. So in terms of single cell biology, um, what has been really, really exciting for us is also, as Fabian said, you know, these huge uh, data sets that are becoming available. And for us, and this will now motivate this, it's like very much about the packing of the DNA on one side, which is often measured well with these images. So this is like DAPI stained images. And then, you know, expression on the other side, um, where you're getting to see, you know, nowadays for over 100,000 cells, often in one experiment, right, the expression um, at every one of, for every single cell in that, in that, um, sample and same for these images, right? You can take these uh, these single cell images, and, you know, very high resolution, and for many many cells per experiment. Um, so that's at the observational level, and Fabian also already mentioned, you know, these are really exciting kind of perturbational data sets that are becoming available that might help us uh, be able to understand how actually genes regulate each other. Um, and so here have different kinds of questions also at the perturbational level. And so what has really excited us is somehow to integrate right, the imaging data sets, um, the expression data sets, and then also the perturbational data sets. Um, and generally, so one of the main uh, challenges that we have found uh, working with single cell uh, biology data sets is that, unfortunately, you know, you can measure all these things and they're very high resolution. Um, for example, gene expression data, right, you get the expression of all our 20,000 genes um, at everyone, for every one of our cells. But the problem is often that getting these measurements actually requires fixing a cell. Um, so that means, and this is still something, you know, you have these experimental kinds of limitations that, for example, you cannot get the DAPI stained image together with the expression of all your 20,000 genes in the same cell. Okay, so often you have these unpaired measurements for some cells, I get expression profiles, for others, I get images, or, you know, for some cells, I measure them before the perturbation or after the perturbation, but again, not both. Um, or, you know, you have different time points. Um, so you might have, you know, data sets from time point one, but then you cannot measure the same cell at time point two, right? So you, again, you don't have these standard time series data sets, you get snapshots over time and you kind of have to um, piece together how the cell would have looked like at an earlier time point or a later time point. And so we see many of these problems, and I'll also say how this relates to SARS-CoV-2 later in the talk. We see many of these problems from a computational perspective when we work with, with single cell biology data sets, at least transport problems. So you either get to see one time point, I want to transport that data set to a next time point, so predict how the cell would look like at a later time point because I cannot measure it experimentally, or I would like to predict you know, from one um, data modality, I would like to predict the imaging modality or the other way around, or I would like to predict the effect of an intervention that I haven't seen, um, or you know, I have seen maybe an intervention in one cell type and I would like to predict it in a different cell type. So all these transport problems are things that we have been working on um, a lot in recent years. And um, just talking about the methods that we'll be using for actually doing this, um, and Fabian has already mentioned this, right? So discriminative modeling is your standard kind of uh, how neural networks have often been employed, where you have like class labels, cats and dogs, um, and you would like to be able to discriminate well between them. As he has mentioned, you know, um, in single cell biology, we often don't have class labels. Um, so we would like to, you know, just take in all of the data that we have uh, and then kind of model it and be able to cluster it, et cetera, be able to have these latent spaces that are representative of this data where we might be able to or want to be able to walk around and maybe generate new data that corresponds to, you know, a particular cell state or a new data modality that you haven't seen or a more uh, a perturbational output that you have not yet seen. And so for these kinds of applications, and you'll hear more, I'm sure, also in this session about autoencoders in single cell biology, autoencoders have been super, super successfully applied. Um, so autoencoders are, uh, you know, a type of neural network, which you can use in order to learn these informative embeddings um, that, you know, you can actually learn without having any labeled data sets. Uh, you can use also labeled data if you have, but you don't need it. And so how you should think of these is just like a nonlinear version of PCA. 
So you have your data, it can be images, it can be RNA-seq data sets, it can be you know, any of the data sets, the tax seek, et cetera, that you have. And from this data that you have, you want to learn a representative embedding that, that you know, includes all of your data. Um, and so how these autoencoders are learned is just uh, by minimizing um, the reconstruction. Line. Okay, so whatever you put in, you, you lead it through this latent space. So think of PCA as this lower dimensional representation. And what you want that comes out is, you know, something that looks very similar to what you put in so that the representation that you learn in the middle is as informative as possible, right? So that you lost as little information as possible. And so that would mean, right, if you can reconstruct whatever, um, whatever you put in from what you learned here in the middle, that means that you have quite good, hopefully, um, representation that is really informative of, of the kinds of data that you put in. And the interesting thing and nice thing about an autoencoder is that it is um, generative, uh, meaning that you can also walk around in this latent space. So here, for example, you know, I could take like um, in this latent space a rabbit and I could walk more towards cat land and I get here a point, right? And I can generate the corresponding image corresponding to it and out would, for example, come a cabbage, right? Some generated image that you have not seen um, but, you know, that would nicely interpolate between these different kinds of um, data sets and would be meaningful um, as well. Right? So that's something that we have been using a lot, and I'll tell you a little bit more about how these autoencoders can be used for these questions of transporting between data modalities, between time points, um, and also between different kinds of perturbational effects. Um, something else that we've been using a lot as well is optimal transport. So this is a very old mathematical tool um, that has been, you know, has really been developed after a question by Napoleon, it has been developed already by Monge, and this has been um, in order to think about how to move resources around. Um, now, the easiest way of thinking about resources, but it can be more general resources, is just to think about a pile of mud that you have to transport from one place to the other. And so optimal transport would then answer the question of what is the optimal way of transporting, you know, one pile of mud that you have over here to another pile of mud that you have over here. Now, how is this anything related to these transport problems that I talked about on the previous slide? Well, you can think of these piles of mud as distributions. Okay, so I have a distribution over, um, you know, some single cell state, um, say, you know, from different mechanical states that I looked at, right, um, different shapes of cells in one distribution, and I have them also at a different time point in another distribution. Um, and now I would like to be able to map between these two distributions to be able to answer questions like, you know, I see a cell in this particular time point, well, how will this particular cell actually look like in a different time point, although I'm not really able to experimentally see how these cells are moving through time, can I maybe through this transport map actually be able to predict how this would happen. So these are the two tools that I'm going to show you um, how we're using them for actually looking at these transport problems um, that we've been excited about in single cell biology. Um, and so let me just show you um, some examples of this. So first, uh, let me show you a combination of autoencoders and optimal transport uh, for moving between different time points. Okay, so I have, um, I would like to, and, and here maybe just to say a little bit more about the, what the main motivation was, you know, something that has always kind of bothered me in terms of, and has been a problem that I have been very excited about, but has been bothering me, is that, you know, I would like to be able to kind of use uh, computational methods or develop computational methods for earlier detection of diseases, say for thinking about cancer. Um, but, you know, our methods have always been trained with whatever a pathologist gives us, right? The pathologist is able to identify some training examples, these are cancers, these are not, and then based on these, they'll actually be training a model. But how will I then ever be able to detect cancer earlier than a pathologist can currently? Well, in order to do that, I need to generate my own training data, right? I cannot rely on training data that comes from a pathologist because then I'll always be, um, only be able to detect cancer at that time point. Um, so how would you generate data at but that, but how would you generate your own training data set and try to predict how a cell looked like at an earlier time point before you know a pathologist was, for example, able to detect whether it is cancerous or not? Um, so we need to be able to move between time points, right? And try to be able to predict how a cell had looked like at an earlier time point. And now here I'm showing you this again, this is all with cell lines, et cetera, but in the paper we also did it in the tissue itself. Um, and this is just to show like how these kinds of optimal transport methods could be used for this. 
So, um, so here you have, you know, different kinds of, um, this is for breast cancer, right, at different kinds of time points when you're still in the normal state, um, when you're fibrocystic, when you're becoming cancerous, and then when you're already metastatic. Um, and so these are data sets that you can obtain, right? And so now here you have all of your cells. So now, first of all, you need to bring them into a space where they're all comparable against each other. Um, so that would be this autoencoder embedding, right? So I have all these cells here. I first, of course, embed them into a space um, where I can move around between them. Um, and so this would be what I'm doing using an autoencoder. So this is my embedding that I get using an autoencoder. And now what I would like to do is be able to move between them, right? So I would like to take, in particular here, I want to move backwards in time. Sometimes you may want to move forwards in time. And so here I'm, I'm moving backwards in time and, for example, taking uh, the metastatic state, so here in green. And as I would like to be able to predict how this cell had looked like, this particular cell had looked like at an earlier time. And move backwards in time and see, for example, what are the features that are changing. So again, here we care about the packing of the DNA. These are DAPI stained images. We want to see how heterochromatin is changing, either when you move forward in time or backwards in time. So these are the features that we have been looking at. And we can, of course, do this with other data sets as well. Um, and so that's optimal transport, right? That you can now move around in this latent space and actually generate data. Um, of course, how and to answer questions like how the cell would have looked like at earlier time points and try to analyze what are the heterochromatin features that are actually changing. And so just um, so that we're all on the same page. So here, you know, for example, only these um, images here at the end are actually real images. Everything else here is generated. Okay? So everything else here is how the cell would have looked like at an earlier time point. Um, so you're starting here in the green state and then you're moving your cells backwards in time. Um, and trying to generate the data and seeing how early would you actually be able to tell that something was going off and or it was not quite right. So that's how optimal transport and, and autoencoders, or just an example of how optimal transport and autoencoders can be used together um, in some space where, you know, an autoencoder first to embed your data in some space where the data sets become comparable to each other, and then optimal transport in order to move between different time points. Um, so moving between data modalities um, also works uh, similarly with autoencoders. So here you don't need an optimal, so optimal transport you need in order to move between different time points. Um, so here we don't have different time points. Say you have, you know, the same population of cells where you take out some for imaging and some for sequencing. And we would like to be able to move between these very different modalities. So we have images on one side, we have sequences on the other side. We'd like to be able to move between them. So how this could be done is by coupling different autoencoders together in the latent space. Um, so how do we do this? So you have your standard autoencoders, right, that go from, say, single cell RNA-seq data to your latent space, back to single cell RNA-seq data, or a taxi, or, you know, anything, molecules, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well, or imaging data. Now you want to go from one modality to a very different modality. Well, so you have your single autoencoders, right, on RNA-seq, you have your autoencoders on images, um, you have them maybe on a taxi, on single cell high C, whatever you have. And so now, well, you want to be able to move between them. Also, you have the same population of cells, right? Some were taken out for imaging, some were taken out for sequencing, for example. So you know it's the same population of cells. Well, so the latent space that represents this distribution, right, should be the same. Particular the distributions in the latent space should be the same because, right, you just took out some at random for imaging and some at random for sequencing. And so that's how you can then couple in the latent space all of your different distributions that you're getting from the different data modalities by, for example, adding another discriminator, right? That should not be able to discriminate whether you come from imaging land or sequencing land because it was the same population of cells. And so in this way, by coupling together um, your autoencoders in the latent space, what you can then do are things like this, where you actually move from, say, DAPI stained images to your latent space to actually generating how, you know, for every one of these image, how the particular expression profile would look like, were you able to get it as well? Or you can go from RNA-seq to your latent space and then to actually generate the image that would correspond to it. Now, of course, you can ask, you know, how would you actually validate any of these things um, since you can still not measure any of this together? Um, so, okay, RNA-seq is not proteins, right? But in the, in the image, you can, for example, also stain for a couple of other genes. 
Um, and then at least see that you're able to also predict, um, you know, whether one of these expression profile, whether the expression of one of the proteins, say, would be up versus the other one. Hopefully, you choose some of the genes that where expression and proteins um, should be highly correlated. But that's one way of at least starting to validate some of this, or you validate it, and it's also something we've done on, say, something like a tax seek and RNA seek, or, or different modalities that can actually be measured together in the same cell, and try to see how well you're actually able to um, generate the missing or the other modality from one of the modalities. Another way um, also that is of great interest and was also brought up for drug discovery, for example, or for virtual drug screening, you have similar questions. Right now here, I will give you a molecule and you would like to be able to predict directly, for example, well, what will happen if you apply the molecule to your cells? Um, so uh, maybe you have some data set like cell painting where you have paired data, right? If a lot of molecules were applied to many different cells um, and you actually get to see the output, and now you would like your model to be able to do this, uh, to actually predict what happens when you put in a new molecule. Um, and so here you would have a new molecule going in and what you would like it to directly generate is the image of how it would look like. Were you going to apply this particular molecule? Um, and here you see how these kinds of, you know, similar methods like these autoencoders or other generative models can actually be used also for virtual drug screening. Okay, so here is a new molecule. Um, this is what our data, what our method would predict, how this looks like. Obviously, it doesn't know where the cell is going to, right, where exactly all the cells are located. So it cannot know because you're not telling it where the cells are going to be located. But what is quite nice is it's actually able to, you know, predict whether the drug will kill most cells, like here in the last one, whether the cells are going to be quite happy, whether the proteins that are going to be most expressed, et cetera, et cetera. So these autoencoders can really be used to, to you know, move around and, and translate between very different modalities, like molecules to images, or RNA-seq to images, or images to RNA-seq, et cetera. Okay, so that was all on the autoencoder set. Um, so now I just want to very, very briefly um, talk about the last thing, and I think I have just a couple of minutes left, um, of uh, how this all relates to source cov and another translation problem, which is actually um, translating between different cell types. Um, so going from, you know, here I have uh, molecules that have been applied to one cell type. And what I would like to do is predict what these molecules will do on another cell type or cell state, right? In particular, if I want to identify drugs um, that could be applied to SARS-CoV-2 infected aged lung epithelial cells, well, that is not in my data set. Often you have like some large scale drug screens that have been applied, right? You don't want to redo the whole large scale drug screen. So you want to be able to predict what will these drugs um, all do um, to these SARS-CoV-2 infected lung epithelial cells and which ones might be able to reverse the effect of the disease in order to get back to the normal state. Um, you may want to predict that for drugs that are already FDA approved if you're doing drug repurposing, or you may want to predict that for completely new molecules. Um, we're just doing it for the FDA. Again, a transport question. How is it Right, so is, is, it, is it just me or Caro? Are you linking up for everyone? Same for me. Yeah, it's not only you. Caro, I could slide Caro OKU. Okay, Am I back? I did. Yeah, thanks. That's great. Appreciate that. Caro? Maybe not. I think she's disconnected from the meeting. Yeah, let's 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 wait until she she dials in again, and um, try to see. People have been already asking questions. I should have said that beforehand. Please use the Q and A from the Zoom feature to actually ask questions right now, or do them later. Mm -hmm. Well, I've been making this small technical announcement. Caro is back. Um, we just we just uh, missed like past last thirty seconds or so, Caro. So if you could just go to that. Um, oh, transport okay. Sorry, I don't know what is happening. And you know, get like if you could like close in a few minutes, that would be kind of yeah. Uh, but of course, it's exciting, so don't don't feel so, really. Um,
So do you hear me? Do you see my slides now? We're back. We we, we do see the slides. Okay. Some, somehow connection is, is kind of bad. Okay. Um, okay. I don't think there's much I can do right now about no. it. Do you hear me? Maybe, maybe we can turn off the video or something like that. But okay. Give it over to me, I guess. Um, Thank you. Let's try this. We can see yes. it. We can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So let me just um, talk just briefly about the problem of, you know, how would you go about drug repurposing for SARS-CoV-2? Um, so that's, again, a transport problem. You have these very large scale um, drug screens, right, that have been applied to some, um, say, cancer cell lines. And you would like to predict what the effect is of these filial cells um, in order to identify the drugs that could then revert the effect of the disease. Um, and so here again is an autoencoder framework, or you know, also other people have used GANs, et cetera, for doing this. And here I'm referring as to some of Fabian's work, um, where you know, maybe you could see um, if you want to predict the effect of a drug on a cell type that you have not yet, or a cell state that you have not yet measured, well, maybe you could do something similar like um, what autoencoders or GANs are used for often in computer vision tasks, maybe something like style transfer. Right, where you know in the in the latent space, what you're doing is um, if you want to add the smi a smile to a person, you have some data and you have some people that you know like to smile, um, and so you'll sometimes measure them with a smile on a normal face, and you can figure out what adding a smile actually corresponds to in the latent space. Maybe the specter here that now corresponds to adding a smile can be moved to a new person that is never smiling, and you just take this point and, and move it back into your original space, and out comes actually a person with a smile. And so what Fabian did in, in this paper here in his group um, is actually using something like this in order to be able to predict what the effect of a drug is on a new cell type that you have or not, new cell states that you have not yet seen. So to predict the effect of a drug across different cell states. Now we've done something like this. And um, so just also to show that, you know, sometimes you do need, um, and, and it might be helpful to also have some new uh, innovation in terms of machine learning, um, machine learning theoretical work. Now, you know, often in, if you go through your autoencoder, you actually go through a lower dimensional latent space. So similar like PCA, right? You usually try to, um, try to get an embedding that is lower dimensional than your original data set. Just take the effect of a drug and move it over to a new cell type or new cell state, meaning that the effect of the drug should always be pointing in the same direction. Otherwise, this is not going to work. Now, if you're thinking about it, if you're going to a lower dimensional space, well, you're going to crumble up your space even more um, so that this really works across many, many, uh, many drugs is very unlikely, right? It can work sometimes, but um, how, you might how you might increase your chances of this actually working is if you go into a higher dimensional latent space, right? The higher dimensional your latent space is, the more directions you actually have in order to align your drug signatures, and then maybe be able to actually transport the effects of drugs across different cell types. Uh, and could you, could you like slowly? Um, oh yeah, okay, I should sorry. stop. It's exciting. So I really want to hear that, but maybe like. Uh, no, no, I'll stop with that. So that's and just to show that that actually works, right? If you go into your higher dimensional latent space, you can, in fact, um, align your drug signatures and apply that in order to identify drugs that could be um, used for reverting the effect of, um, of SARS CoV 2 infection in the aged individuals. Um, and also tell you a little bit uh, just to wrap up to show that, you know, this can actually lead to new. Uh, um, that can be identified using this, in this case here, RIPK1, um, that is actually what is really exciting. Um, first of all, we never put this into our model that it actually binds directly to source of two proteins. Um, and also um, it is currently, it just entered actually phase two drug trials, which is also exciting for us to see how this uh, will actually pan out as well. Um, so with that, let me end um, by telling, by just thanking you all and sorry about the connection that is breaking off. Uh, um, none of this would have pervaded all of it. Um, Shiva's lab on how to connect, you know, the packing of the DNA in the shape of cells, in particular here for the aging um, fibroblasts in this case and, um, and the effect of drugs that it could have. So with that, thank you. And sorry, I may, maybe once I end this, I can actually turn on my, um, my video again. Yes. 
Thank you so much, uh, Carl, for exciting presentation, really nice review of, of, of some of your older work, but then of course, uh, exciting new development. It is over complete, as we used to call this, uh, we call it like for matrix factorization, over complete matrix factorization type of auto encoder. We really wonder what, what Neil would say with respect to sort of hyperparameter screens, because usually you know, on those screens, we usually take small ones. I should not ask questions though, but like say what people say. For example, there's a question from uh, Jake uh, Sauter, who's asking about transporting between modalities. Uh, if if uh, you mean training the unimodality AE completely separately, and then finding the optimum transport from one modality latent space to another, or, or something different. Yeah, perfect. So you would often start with training at least one of the modalities separately um, to get a good, already a good latent space embedding. Um, usually for us, the most informative one is the one you want to start with. So for us, it is images. And then you train another modality, uh, another autoencoder on the other modality that you have to match um, the latent space representation of the first thing. You can also train everything, you know, iterate between training, et cetera. For us, what has worked well, and for the proofs, this is what we would do. Uh, for us, what has worked well is you train the more informative one, meaning the one that requires mm -hmm. a larger latent space first, and then you match the one um, that requires a smaller latent space to this uh, more informative one. Okay, so that's sort of still a, a need for potentially prioritizing one that you're sort of more, more, more sure about, something like that, right? Yeah, so we would just usually use the one where you actually use any the higher dimensional latent space. Yeah. It's kind of funny, Rob, right? I mean, do you think it's dimensionality that pushes? I guess informativeness could be, you know, if you just copy like a few sort of, like just copy the variables, it could be easier to mention, but not as informative. Uh, sorry, the latent space, right? So where you would need, mm. so this is more informative in the sense of information it is, it's containing. So if you copy oh, okay, it, you still don't need the higher features. dimensional latent space. Sorry, I understand. Thanks so much. There, uh, there was uh, uh, Kirolos Hanna uh, commenting that it was a great talk and uh, asking about the breast cancer prediction problem. If a more accurate approach would be screening healthy patients and then prospectively following them and potentially separating the biopsy image into cancerous, non cancerous, so that just the problem. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it would be exciting if you have a lot mm -hmm. of like very fine time series mm -hmm. data sets. It's just uh, not many patients would be happy to actually do this and, and give the data on a very, very fine timeline. Um, mm -hmm. So, of course, it would be really exciting if one would have this kind of data. Yeah, it would be nice, right, to, to, to fill, fill up those times. I mean, I think this is the more general question in all of these this is pseudo temporal inference that exactly. we have real time. Yeah. I think there might be some approaches to potentially map on, 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 on real time if you sort of. We also leverage transport for that. There has been this one paper. Do you remember, do you remember from uh, uh, what was one? This 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 one first uh, from from Eric's group. The the optimal transport for this sort of yeah. very fine grade time series. Reprogramming. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cheating so up. we also looked at yeah. So they did on reprogramming. We also looked at T cell um, activation. So there again, mm. you know, you can for validating this these kinds of approaches, um, you would want to actually take something where you can where you can then really take your fine scale um, time series. We, com we complement this by population type of model where you sort of really were sort of pushing things through with a PDE or ODS and that. I think then you can also link real time to that. Yep, Let's maybe ask awesome. one more technical question. Um, there was Chen Ling Shu asking about what the objective would be when doing optimal transport. Is it uh, least distance? And in particular, I think this point is why I like the question. How could you maybe relate this to causality? Because I think it's often a question that comes up. You know, there's like this field of causal inference there, it didn't work high dimensional. And then you sort of often implied already in the OT part, maybe you can sort of briefly answer this time. Yeah, so, so I would maybe relate the other part. So, for, so one mm -hmm. really exciting or really exciting opportunity in single cell biology for causality is that you actually have access to large scale perturbational data. So somehow perturbations allow you to ask the causal question as a standard prediction question. Right, because you're already you're you're getting quite a lot about causal relationships, right? If you're able to predict the effect of any unseen intervention, um, and that is causal, right? So if you can predict the effect of an unseen intervention, well, you know what is actually downstream of this perturbation, and thus you do know something about the causal relationships. So having access to a lot of perturbational data then allows you to answer causal questions um, just as a prediction kind of question. Um, OT is maybe a bit different. Um, optimal transport there, I mean, you, for us, it has always been of moving between time points um, is for me not yet causal. Um, it is, you know, once you can actually say something about uh, the underlying gene regulatory networks or how perturbations will change your, you know, if the optimal transport you're predicting goes in one direction and now with a perturbation, how would this transport actually look differently? 
Um, but I think that is still a very hard problem to do. So in particular, this, this, this latest, uh, I think it was connecting molecules or pathways. I, I kind of missed it. This latest uh, DAC yeah. that you were inferring, that was not implicit in the existing model, but that was sort of a, a posteriori type of analysis, right, Cole? Oh, perfect. Yes. Yeah, so there you're exactly. So, so there you are predicting the effect of perturbations. Um, but then afterwards, just predicting the effect of perturbations is still a black box, right? So then you would still actually like to understand what is the model doing? How is it able to predict the effect of a new perturbation? And so you can use also, and this is something that we have worked a lot about on causal structure discovery algorithms um, to actually give this black box a bit more of an understanding for humans, right? Of what is actually the underlying gene regulatory network and how, what is the mechanism underlying why this particular perturbation does what we're predicting it to do. Thanks so much, Kao. This was a great presentation. Really enjoyed it. Sorry for the technical hiccup, but I think- Yeah, sorry from my side. Is... Wonderfully, and I think we should move, move on uh, to Nia Yosef. So going a bit further uh, west. Good morning, Nia. I hope you're doing fine. Good morning. Uh, can you hear me okay? I can hear you very well. Thank you very much. Let me just briefly introduce Nia again. I don't think he needs all that much introduction, but I should just uh, say he's a very nice guy. And as an associate professor at, uh, at the moment at the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at Berkeley, um, started his group uh, there, I think something like five, six years or seven years even now, now ago. Uh, before that, he did PhD at Weizmann and uh, a great postdoc at, 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 at the Broad, doing a few seminar papers and also nice reviews that we keep citing with Aviv and others. And uh, been just fantastic colleagues, been one of the first to, to, to push the autoencoder ideas uh, in, in, in the field, particular variation ones. And I don't know how many star VI methods are around now, but we all enjoy them. I think the, the editing side of these things is cool, not only of the, the deep learning ones, like many of his tools before and as well. And we're looking forward to, to listening to Nia talking about his generative models. Hi, uh, so uh, thank you very much Fabian. So, uh, and thanks for, the organizers for putting together this this uh, fantastic workshop. It, it's really fun to be here this morning, early morning for me, uh, and listening to these talks and also have the opportunity to share with you. Um, and similar to uh, what Caroline did, I, I will start with a, a general biological context uh, to, to my talk, just to provide the, uh, to provide the motivation uh, and just show you how we think about things, right? So I listed here a number of questions that one may uh, think about when or that arise when we think about processes of development or cell differentiation these are very fundamental very basic questions like um, what is the sequence of events that led from a progenitor population to uh, the observed diversity of cell types that we see so here on the right is just a figure of uh, it's supposed to represent hematopo hematopoiesis so just you know parts of it so just as an example and when we look at the process like that we can ask what changes in the phenotype of the cells as they go along this trajectory of development what regulates fate decisions, what regulates commitment, and so on. Uh, and, and again, as I said, I, uh, oh, and um, um, as, a, as a, it turns out, right, if you look at the past couple of years, look at the literature, the single cell genomics turns out to be a very powerful paradigm to address these kind of questions. And as, as a computational group, uh, what we do is we like to develop methods and apply them to, to tackle these kind of questions, really leverage that data. So if, as the context for today, I'm going to use this project that we uh, recently finished in the lab, uh, where we uh, look at uh, the process of development of T cells in the thymus, and we'll talk about it a little bit more. This is a fantastic collaboration between my group uh, and Aaron Streets and Ellen Roby, and was really uh, spearheaded and led by Zoe Steyer, who is um, a joint student uh, of myself and Aaron, who just graduated. So uh, this is where our story begins in the thymus. Not many people know even where it is in your body. It's like you can see my layer map here where it is located. Uh, and the thymus is very important, especially in the early age, uh, in early ages, because this is where T cells develop. Uh, so in that process, uh, progenitor cells come from the bone marrow, they enter the thymus. Uh, and when they enter the thymus, they go through a process of specification of their antigen recognition capacities, uh, selection for the most effective uh, T cells for immune response and maturation of those cells. And at the end of the process, these cells leave the thymus, go out to circulation and ready to fight infections. Uh, as I said, you know, and one thing to know is that T cells of course are, are a very important fundamental part of the adaptive immune system. 
So uh, when you look at this process a little bit more closely, we see that there are two major arms to it. There is more complexity there, but the primary two arms there, uh, one, one uh, those are a, a, what we call the CD8 positive T cells, uh, T cells that are cytotoxic, basically they kill uh, infected cells. And then we have the CD4 positive T cells, which are the regulatory, um, so the helper T cells that control immunity mostly by intercellular communication. Uh, and both of them come from this uh, similar uh, progenitor population of these double positive uh, cells in the thymus. So uh, here are the questions that uh, we asked before, but just really in the context of the thymus, right? So what are the sequences? And, and these are questions that we have been learned a lot, but still there are a lot of unknowns, and this is what we wanted to tackle, right? So what is the sequence of molecular event that led from these thymic progenitors, those double positive earlier cells, uh, to the two mature T cell populations? And what regulates commitment into each one of those lineages? Uh, so we already know quite a lot of, about the you know, specific regulation of each lineage in itself, like the transition factors that are specific and so on, but still there are many, many black holes there. So what regulates commitment into each of the lineages? And third, can we influence those uh, specific commitment mechanisms? So, um, yeah, so, so these are the questions that we come up with. And if you think about it from, the from the genomic perspective, right? Um, we want to use RNA sequencing, we want to look at the entire transcriptome and we want to be able to address these questions. So one thing that we can do is we can do uh, bulk sequencing, bulk RNA sequencing, right? Because we have all these gating strategies, we can sort the cells at different points along the differentiation process. Uh, but, and we can do that, it will be very helpful. We can find new molecules and so on, but it will leave us, give us a limited perspective. Only a few data points averaging over many states. Of course, you know, this is, uh, uh, obvious for the, for the crowd here that it would be very helpful to have single cell genomics in this case. Because if you just take the thymus, uh, single cell genomics of thymocytes in the thymus, right, is going to give us a snapshot that's going to span the entire process. It's going to give us a continuous view of this process, uh, all the phases along it, multiple phases, transient events. We are able to do, you know, to look at timing of, of, of events that we cannot see with bulk uh, sequencing and so on, right? So that's the promise and that's the idea. That's the motivation why we think it's a good idea to do single cell RNA sequencing here in this system to study it. So here is the, uh, the design of the experiment, right? So uh, what Zoe did in this case, right? You, you take a thymus from a wild type mouse, sort out all the thymus sites from this, uh, from this thymus. And supposedly what we hope to get is this uh, a spectrum of cells or representation of cells from the entire process, right? From the double positive progenitor all the way to the, uh, to the mature populations. Um, but in order to uh, distinguish between the cells that go either to the helper arm or to the cytotoxic arm very early in the process, where it's hard to distinguish between them, she also included mutant mice where the T cells are restricted to either one of the, or to only one of the two lineages, right? So then she took all of these data uh, from all of these mice and she did single cell RNA sequencing for all of these. So together we have this very complex data set, right? That has like seven different genotypes, the different knockouts and transgenic mice and the wild type mouse, 19 different batches, 80,000 cells, 8,000 genes. So we have all this information and now we want to use it to distill uh, and to start, start addressing the question that we started out with, right? So now we can zoom out for a second and think about it in a, in a bit more abstract way, right? So we have our data, our experimental design, our data. And now we're thinking about all these fundamental questions that, that, that we think about in almost any single cell RNA seq study. Uh, the first one is stratification, right? Um, how can we learn structure? Uh, so for example, in some studies, we'll be clustering the cells in the subpopulations. In this case, how do we assign cells to the right position in the lineage commitment process? And how do we identify new and interesting phases of fates? Comparative analysis, what are the differences between the two lineages? or mechanism, how is lineage commitment regulated? So these are the questions that we want to address with the data. But of course, there the, are the issues there because the data itself, the single cell RNA seq that I've shown you is, you have a high dimensionality, so it's very challenging to find structure in it. Uh, there is bias, right? There are very strong batch effects. Uh, so if you just take all the data from all the different mice together, it's gonna to be very difficult to make sense out of. And uncertainty, there is a lot of noise in the data and the sampling depth is, is very limited. So as many of you know, we have a lot of zeros in this data, something that we need to combat. So, uh, so yeah, so these are our three problems. So uh, in the ideal solution, what we want, we want to have some sort of a method uh, that will give us two things. Uh, the first thing that we wanna have is some sort of a normalized 
high dimensional or a representation of the data, basically normalized gene expression levels with quantification of uncertainty around the, quanti uh, of the quantification of the expression of every gene in every cell and mitigation of, uh, of low sensitivity and mitigation of bias. So that's the first thing that we want. So basically a good representation of the high dimensional data. The second thing that we want is a low dimensional summary of cell state where every cell is represented by a low dimensional vector. And this representation controls for the bias for the batch effects and also reflects uncertainty. And we can use that you know, to stratify the cells uh, to visualize the data and so on. Right, so that's what we wanna do ideally. And we want to use, we won't take a probabilistic point of view uh, when, we do the, when we do that. So uh, this is where uh, the SEVI family of tools uh, came from, a generative modeling for single cell RNA sequencing with SEVI stands for single cell variation and inference. This is uh, again, another fantastic collaboration with Mike Jordan's group uh, at, um, at, at Berkeley. Uh, and here are some of the individuals that, uh, that really spearheaded this work. Chen Ling Xu just asked a question, so I'm going to uh, call her name uh, in the previous uh, talk. And of course, uh, all the other ones, a, a really fantastic group of individuals that developed um, and contributed to this work. So um, let me just walk you through a little bit on, on the principles behind uh, a, a SEVI, right? And just for just for RNA sequence, right? So how do we achieve these these um, these two goals that we have uh, of having a normalized representation of the high dimensional data of the gene expression data and have some sort of um, um, a good low dimensional representation summary of cell state. Right, so uh, um, we're using this, this approach of generative modeling and here is the generative process of SCVI. So first of all, we are making two assumptions. The first assumption is that the generative process is low dimensional. The data is coming, is basically inherently low dimensional or it can be summarized into low dimension. And the second one is that the noise fits with the negative binomial distribution, which makes sense, uh, makes a lot of sense for count statistics, makes even more sense for Trans, uh, gene expression data because uh, that's the stationary distribution of transcriptional kinetics under some um, uh, under a reasonable uh, model of, of promoter uh, kinetics, promoter on and off. So uh, this is how the, the, uh, the generative process works, right? So how we generate data for a given cell. The first thing is we select the cell, the state of the cell from a low dimensional uh, a Gaussian space, uh, but let's say about 10, 20 dimension of isotropic Gaussians. We also have the idea of the donor. And then this low dimensional representation that we drew uh, and the idea to donor go into a function, a nonlinear function that returns gene expression data. So return data in much higher dimension. In our case, this function is, uh, is a neural network. In addition to that, another latent variable is the uh, correction factor for sampling rates. So every, we need to correct because different cells will have different sampling rates. We need to correct for that. So we also draw it from a normal distribution. And together, uh, the normalized gene expression data, which is just sum to one and the correction factor, uh, go into a negative binomial distribution and with a dispersion parameter, and that generates the data, right? So our model basically has uh, parameters and it has latent variables. And what you want to do, you want to be able to learn these parameters and latent variables in a way that will overall maximize the likelihood of the data. Uh, once we have that, we can calculate the posterior for the, uh, for the uh, latent variable. So for example, we, given a cell, we can calculate the posterior uh, representation of it in low dimensional space. We can calculate the posterior correction factor for it and so on, um, and estimate the parameters. So this is what we would like to do, but unfortunately it's, we cannot do it directly. It, it's, it's difficult because in order to, uh, to perform this learning, um, we need to estimate the evidence for the data, the probability of the data given, you know, the gene expression given the donor ID in this case. Uh, and this is difficult to do because it's hard to integrate. It requires integration. It's hard to integrate because we have negative binomial, because we have a neural network. Uh, so the solution is to maximize the low bound of the evidence with variational inference. So hence the name single cell variational inference, or in this case, using variational autoencoder. So this is how uh, the SCBI uh, model looks like. We start with the, uh, the input is a matrix of uh, cells by genes. Uh, and then the uh, encoder part of the network basically infers a low dimensional representation. Um, where we can think about it as a, the variation of posterior, basically an approximation of the uh, true posterior uh, of the latent representation of the cells in low dimension given the data. Uh, and then we have a decoder network that goes from this uh, representation of the variation of posterior into the generative model. 
uh, where we represent the probability of the observations in this negative binomial model. So this is basically uh, uh, the architecture of this, of this uh, variational autoencoder and how it works. But bottom line, what does it give us? So once again, if you look at this part where we take the data and compress it into low dimension, right? Uh, this is the first part of our generative process. Uh, so if we do a posterior sampling from this variation, I'm sorry, sampling from this variation of posterior, basically what it gives us, it gives us a low dimensional representation for every cell. And this low dimensional representation accounts for variation in sampling rates. Um, it's also batch corrected because we, it, you see that it's, this distribution is conditioned on the batch, uh, the batch label. Uh, and it also gives us an estimation of uncertainty because it is still uh, a, 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 a stochastic random variable. I'm sorry, a random a, a, a latent variable. Right, so this is one part of the model. Uh, yeah, so, so with this uh, low dimensional representation, we can visualize the data, we can stratify the cells into cell states and so on. So that's one set of tasks that we can do with the model. The second thing that we get out of this model is the, the generative part of it, right? Where we can actually generate again the data in high dimension. So the generative part of the model gives us a corrected high dimensional representation that account for a variation in sampling rates, right? In sequencing depth of different cells. It's batch corrected. And again, because we are looking here at the distribution, it gives us an estimation of the uncertainty of the data, which we can use for various tasks like doing differential expression or doing uh, a annotation of cell states and so on, right? So uh, that's basically the, uh, the, the idea. Now it gives us a kind of a full probabilistic view of the data, really trying to estimate to, to the best of our ability, what is the uncertainty uh, behind uh, the various measurements, either in low dimension or in high dimension. And uh, it's scalable, which is also critical, uh, you know, because it's neural networks, they, they can be trained on GPUs and, and that scales nicely because it's important just because uh, data sets grow very big these days. So as we are in the wild, this is really quickly, since it came out, we used it uh, either by us or by others for various uh, applications, either for the various cell atlases, like the Tabula Sapiens project that just uh, came out uh, at the BioArchive this week. Uh, it's like one of the, you know, a kind of, a early draft of the UMSL Atlas, also for various applications in, in immunology. But we also use this, and I think Fabian mentioned it a little bit, to, to develop additional tools to tackle other specific tasks in, uh, uh, in you know, generally single cell genomics, but also tailor it to other modalities. And this is what I want to tell you about, uh, about next. So remember, uh, now let's go back to our time site uh, data. So remember I told you that we have, you know, all of these different uh, genetic backgrounds and, and so on, and we take all of them together, we do single cell RNA-seq. But what we've done here was not really single cell RNA-seq, we did something a little bit more. Here we actually use site-seq. So for every cell, we don't only have uh, the transcriptome, but we also have measurements of about 150 uh, proteins or surface proteins, the abundance of proteins on the surface of each cell. Uh, and we, as, as I said, we use SiteSeq uh, from the Smebert lab, which I'm sure that many people in the audience here know. And uh, uh, but basically the idea here is to tag antibodies with, uh, with, a, with a DNA tag that uh, has a poly A at the end of it, and then it can be captured in a similar way uh, to the endogenous RNA and quantify with single cell RNA sequencing really in briefly. Now, why do we do it in the Thymocyte uh, project? Uh, we do it because it gives us a more, having the protein data, the measurement of protein on the surface of the cell, gives us a more reliable definition of cell state that really relies on, on, on proteins and, and not only on RNA. And it also allows us to have a conversation uh, with the previous literature, with the more traditional literature in immunology, uh, where cells are really uh, identified by surface protein markers. That's the language, hence the CD4, CD8, and so on. So we really want to have those and be able to do like this in silico fax uh, um, uh, um, uh, analysis and so on, and really uh, uh, be able to, uh, to connect our results to what was previously known. So, but so now the data is a little bit more complicated, though, right? You can't just apply a CVI as this. Because if you look at the RNA data, just generally, and the protein data, they have different noise characteristics. For the RNA data, uh, we sometimes we see like a big mode at zero because we have a lot of zeros, but, but that's about it, right? We don't, the RNA data doesn't have a background, usually doesn't have a lot of background noise that is, uh, is non-zero. Uh, conversely, the protein data does come 
very often with non-zero background values, right? So, uh, and, and we need to account for these. And these non-zero background values come from, you can think about it as, as like non-specific binding of, of the antibody or some resist, residual signals that come from the antibodies. So uh, yeah, so this is, this is the challenge, right? And what was previously done uh, when this technology just came out a couple of years ago is people would just analyze separately, analyze each modality separately. Uh, so only the proteins separately and only the RNA, uh, and then use one modality to inter interpret the results from the other. For example, learn the late, latent representation only with the RNA data, and then overlay the protein data on it. And so then there was no model uh, to describe, uh, there was no, also no specific model to describe the noise uh, in the protein data. Like, uh, really, how do we, how do we really account for this uh, uh, background noise uh, in a single model? Right, so um, we did some thinking here and realized that we can still uh, extend SCVR in a way that will account for this. Uh, and this is the model uh, that we call Total VI uh, after Total Seek, which was the uh, kind of the patented name of the, of the, of the technology. Uh, so the Total VI, in Total VI, the input is a matrix, not only of gene expression data, but for every cell, we also have the protein data. Right? And then it takes both of these together. And again, the uh, encoder step of Total VI learns a joint a latent representation for every cell that reflects both of the modalities, both the RNA data and the protein data, right? And that's important because it lets us to find structure that really depends not only on the RNA content of the cell, but also on what it, pre uh, what it uh, presents on its surface. Uh, the second, the, uh, the generative model part of this, uh, of this, uh, of total VI, and uh, now is split in two. So with the gene expression data, we generate them uh, from the latent representation, again, using a negative binomial distribution like before. But for the protein data, now we have a negative binomial mixture uh, where we have uh, two negative binomials with a mixing component, one for the background signal and one for the foreground signal. Um, and so that's basically help us to, to really model this, uh, this noise structure directly uh, in, in the data. So Total VI was the first one that really provided joint representation of cell state in this kind of an intrinsic way. Uh, another important property of it is that it, it, co it can correct for this non-specific antibody signal. Uh, and uh, I, I won't have time to go into that, but uh, we, uh, we can see in some in certain uh, instances that, that can be pretty important. And finally, it provides a way to do hypothesis testing, uh, not only on the RNA data, but also on the protein data. So again, for example, doing differential expression, looking at correlations, et cetera. So that's uh, total VI. And now we are ready to go back to our, uh, to our data, uh, to our thymus data. So, um, so just to remind you, uh, we had this experimental design of seven genotypes, 19 batches, 18,000 cells, about 8,000 genes and about 100 proteins out of the 150 that we actually got good signal for. So it's about 100 uh, proteins. And this is the, uh, what we see here is a low dimensional embedding with GMAP of the data of the 20, of a 20 dimensional latent space that is learned with uh, total VI, right? So this is basically how total VI perceive the data, just how we see it in two dimensions. So now we can look at this uh, bunch of dots and we can remember our questions. Like what is the sequence of molecular events that led from a progenitor population to the mature ones? What regulates phase decisions uh, and can we influence it? So uh, the first thing that we did here was to see where the different groups of mice, either the wild type that are in purple, that are unrestricted, they can either differentiate into the helper lineage or the cytotoxic or the helper only or the cytotoxic only. And we can see that we have this nice picture of mixing here in the latent space where here at the beginning, we have a mixing of all three, but then this part right here is just the uh, helper cells, uh, and this part right here is the cytotoxic cells, right? So that means that we have this kind of partial mixing that start to unveil what is uh, what is actually uh, going on here. So when we look yeah, at you could, could sort of close up soon as we will be back. Sorry. Sure. Yeah. Um, so when we look at the at gene expression data and protein data, we can see that um, uh, indeed uh, the helper lineage marker. Uh, is, is kind of on on the upper part and the setox marker is on in the lower part. When we look at additional molecules that we know how they're supposed to behave tem temporally, like an early marker, a transient marker or late marker, we can see that what we actually have here is a depiction of time, right? So uh, from the progenitor population right here on the left uh, to the helper population in kind of one time course and the cytotoxic in another time course. And we did a lot of work really to convince ourselves that this is a good representation of time. 
But once we have, we can start going to the entire genome and the entire proteome and start, um, start to identify all of these genes that, uh, that change over time, right? So we have all these waves of transcription uh, that really happen uh, continuously in those, in those time courses. And that helps us really, uh, really address our first question. What is the sequence of molecular events that happen in differentiation? And we can start identifying all of these key positions where key events happen in this process. Now, I won't have time to tell you about the, all, of these, all of these key events and so on. I just want to focus on one of those. But we looked very early here, uh, just before we see like the clear divergence between the two populations, before the master regulators of those become induced very, very early in the process. And we ask the question, what regulates fate decision? Is there something that regulates fate decision or fate commitment? Not decision, actually, in this case, not decision. What regulates fate commitment already very early in this process? So um, one thing to remember is that if you look at these time points, this very, 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 very early time point here, there is no good cell surface markers to, to isolate the early helper from the early cytotoxic cells. So that means that we really need single cell RNA sequencing and this pseudotime analysis to do this trick. So uh, what we've done in this case, we just take gene expression data in this case, and we compare the two lineages at this very, very early time point. And when we do that, uh, there is a lot more details here, but we are looking for regulators that we think may be uh, regulating those different, different differences in expression. And one of our top hit is the transcription factor called NFAT, which we think it really regulates specifically the CD4 lineage, but not the CD8 lineage. NFAT is uh, regulated by uh, intercellular calcium. So uh, the idea was, to try to target uh, intracellular calcium, uh, uh, intracellular calcium, I'm sorry, in the cells. This is the last part of can we influence it? And what you can see here is that if you really target uh, intracellular calcium signaling in the cells, we don't see any effect on the maturation of the CD8 T cells, but we really see a marked decrease in the maturation of the CD4 T cells, meaning that we were able to find with this pseudotime analysis and with total VI, really this, this um, a very, very early uh, elusive mechanism that separates between these two lineages. So uh, just to summarize, uh, we had these three questions that we started up with, uh, just kind of generic questions that we have on, on developmental processes. And what I've shown you is how we use total VI, this kind of idea going from experimental design to model to making hypotheses. Uh, so the first thing is uh, the, latent, uh, the latent representation of the data uh, gave rise to this high resolution pseudotemporal map of cell states during time site development. Uh, and then the generative model and the high dimensional representation of the data allows us to do hypothesis testing and really identify changes in RNA protein expression. Uh, and that in the end led to the hypothesis on the new role for calcium signaling as an early regulator of this process. So just to uh, summarize, Fabian, uh, how should I uh, wrap up or do I have a few minutes to go? I, th I think it'd be really good to wrap up because we, you know, we have okay. just kind of- So, like, uh, uh, okay. So um, one thing is that, you know, I've shown you all of these uh, deep learning, uh, uh, various, uh, uh, you know, approaches that, that can be done, you know, with, with, uh, to, to analyze this data, but those are very tricky to work with in practice. Um, and they don't have really good interface with things like ScanPy or Sorat, and, and uh, it's, it's, not, it's not trivial uh, to use them. So that's why we spent a, a, a quite a lot of time in the last two years uh, thinking about from the engineering perspective, and trying to come up with a software solution that will allow people to actually uh, use these tools uh, more easily. Uh, and this is the, uh, uh, the, the result of this effort, something we call SCVI tools, which is a library, an open source library for deep probabilistic analysis for things and genomics. Now, SCVI tools is available online. Uh, we have a, um, a preprint outside and uh, it, it embeds within it code for uh, an analyzing multiple modalities, not, not only RNA protein, but also chromatin data, special, and the combination of those. Uh, it has complete pipelines from normalization to downstream analysis. Um, another thing that is important there that it comes with a developer API. So uh, helps people you know, develop new models uh, uh, without uh, a lot of the overhead that comes with that. And uh, yeah, and that's uh, out there and uh, we are always happy to get feedback uh, on that. So uh, please do. And just to end, I already acknowledge the people that were involved in this study. So I'll just add my funding sources and thank you very much for listening and thank Fabian for the patience. Thanks, Nia. Fantastic and really cool to see the revolution of all these models. So scanning things up. Um, I, I, I think we can take a few questions and uh, maybe we should get started with one from the chat. Please, people, if you just have more questions, uh, use Q&A and, and add some more.
but uh, Michal Sartre asked uh, to generate data that you, you, you actually mentioned that you use uh, uh, four functions that get you Z and S. Can you explain a bit more about the characteristic of that function F and how you particularly define yeah. it? Exactly. So F is a neural network. Okay. So F, uh, F is a neural network. F is in a sense, you can think about it as the decoder in the variational autoencoder, right? Yeah. So, um, yes. So, right, I mean, I, I guess like in the simple setting, it could be a linear thing and then, you know, you have your PCA, Absolutely. you have like a, a version of what's it called, probabilistic PCA, I would say, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so the decoder can definitely be linear. Uh, and uh, this is something that, uh, you know, the, the LDVAE, uh, so, ah, okay. yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, this is actually some work that we've done uh, with, with Leo Pachter, uh, led, by, led by his lab, uh, just to show that. And that makes the latent space a bit more interpretable, kind of pushing it a little bit more to the linearity. Yeah. Uh, but it's not mandatory, right? So you, you have the freedom to control for, for, uh, for this FW. Mm. We played around with this as well. We had like a short uh, oh, no, mute. Sure, uh, or something like that. Please go ahead. Watch this talking to me. Yeah. Can you ask again? No, I didn't say anything. Oh, I, I, th I thought someone was asking actually explicitly. Okay, me, 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 I hope, hope that's okay. So, so, so this, this, I, I think that was pretty cool. I have, I have a more general question, uh, sort of trying to connect a little bit to, to what, what, what Carlos said, right? So, I really like the Bayesian view of, of things. Um, I guess it kind of naturally gives you some type of uncertainty estimate. Maybe you can comment a little bit on that, and potentially then how you would link that to the optimal transport formulations that Caro has been choosing, which in a sense, you sort of remap what you said. I mean, I guess in your case, you always had this covariate, I think, I don't know if you call it SOC or something like that, like the sample, sample one, right? And that kind of makes densities match on top of each other. So in a sense, you're kind of implicitly adding an OT type of constraint, if, if, if you wish. So maybe you can briefly yeah. explain that. No, that, that, that's correct. I mean, you, you can, you can incorporate many of the, now you can incorporate many of those covariates in the model uh, and you can make predictions when you condition on, on those covariates. So that means that it lends itself very naturally, right? To do exactly this kind of transport. Say, okay, what happens if I just change this covariate to something else? And then you get, uh, and then you can get, you know, at least pair the model, what would be the predicted? You can either go to the latent space or to gene expression uh, and, and make those predictions for sure. Um, this is, uh, you can think about it as one way to do these latent space games, you know, to, to make predictions to go from, from one observation to the next. Um, for sure, this is one way that you can do that. Using uncertainty there is also very important, right? So when you do these, uh, these, these uh, you know, either latent space arithmetic or even do these uh, kind of changing the covariate, right? It's very good to look at, uh, at, at the uncertainties around them. And, and that can be done just by sampling from the variation of posterior. Right, and that gives you kind of this cloud of noise around whatever it is you're able to predict. And the way that we use it currently is mostly for just for doing differential expression, but it can definitely be used for those as well. Thanks, thanks so much, Nia, for a fantastic presentation. Very insightful. I think we need to move on. Appreciate it again. Thanks, everybody. So, so you know, we have a we have an academia industry type of seminar. So we're excited to to have Michael Schnalli joining us. Um, talking about um, recent development in 10x genomics, just sort of briefly giving you background. Michael is training again, mathematician, um, but then I think uh, doing this in Boston, being sort of short postdoc, I believe, at, at Eric Landry's lab. Before yep. then, sort of ages ago, it feels uh, transitioning as a, a founding scientist, uh, head of R&D at 10x genomics. This was 2013 already, and then since then, sort of keeping us busy. Um, I liked in your CV that you actually have under 10x genomics. We are hiring. Contact me if you are for a challenge. That's a that's a nice twist. I can I can pick it up. But we are looking forward to hearing, of course, about recent developments. We haven't sort of touched much about spatial yet, so I, I'm sure there's something coming from that. Looking forward to presentation. Absolutely. So thank you so much. Uh, hopefully, you can see my screen. And slides well? Yes, we can. Perfect. Cool. So yeah, I'm Mike Schnaldevin. I'm the SAP of R&D and I'm a founding scientist at 10X Genomics and really excited to present to all of you. And um, thanks to the organizers in particular, uh, Lewis, uh, for inviting me. So um, this is a you know, machine learning uh, themed workshop, but I'm going to give uh, 
certainly the least machine learning themed talk and, and perhaps almost no actual machine learning in my talk. So I thought I should at least start with a quote from a famous um, uh, AI researcher who's Peter Norvig, who's the head of R&D at uh, Google, who, who says this more data beats clever algorithms, but better data beats more data. And I like this quote because A, I think it's true and it kind of resonates with me, but it also, um, I think, highlights a lot of what we um, really get motivated by at 10X. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, some of which I'll be able to give you kind of a, a glimpse into uh, today. So, you know, at 10X, you really build technologies that are aimed at um, giving you insight into biology that um, was impossible with previous technologies. And we think about, you know, those technologies as, um, uh, we think about three critical axes uh, when we think about those technologies. The first is um, scale. So being able to run, you know, large numbers of cells, large numbers of tissues, large numbers of samples, because ultimately that's, you know, really what powers um, the kind of studies that people need to do and the kind of inferences people need to make with data. Um, but also, of course, resolution. So, you know, getting the right uh, kind of information from the fundamental building blocks like cells, getting the right analytes, combinations of analytes. And then finally, uh, a really important uh, feature that we think about is access. So really, you know, um, building technologies that can be broadly used out in the real world. So they're not just, you know, powerful uh, in a central setting, but can actually uh, be applied to, you know, really interesting samples. <clears throat> So, you know, our products are organized into um, three platforms. Um, the first is our, our Chromium single cell platform, which is, you know, really a, a powerful discovery platform for dissociated single cells and its powered projects like the Human Cell Atlas, among many others. And then uh, we have a, a newer platform, uh, which is also on the market, which is our Visium Spatial platform. And this is um, similar in a lot of ways to our Chromium platform that it builds on top of uh, next generation sequencing and using barcoding, but now uses these barcodes to tag molecules, not by uh, the dissociated cell that they came from, but by their position within a tissue. And then we have a newer platform, which is not yet on the market, uh, which is our in situ platform. Uh, and this is a spatial platform, which is really kind of more targeted in nature. Uh, and uh, we see as being really powerful for um, translational applications uh, and ultimately uh, clinical applications as well. Uh, we've launched a, a lot of products over the years. As uh, Fabian said, we've been trying to keep everyone busy, uh, hopefully in a good way. Um, and, you know, really that's been divided largely into single cell and now spatial products, um, single cell side, starting with, you know, gene expression and then expanding from there into many, many different key analytes, um, such as immune, uh, paired immune cell receptors, uh, chromatin accessibility, uh, surface proteins, CRISPR profiling, uh, and now most recently with our Multium product doing uh, com combined uh, chromatin accessibility and gene expression from the same cells. Uh, and then on the Visium side, uh, our initial product introduction in 2019, and then our most recent uh, addition to that, uh, the a version of Visium that's optimized for working with FFPE tissues, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, so, you know, I think as I, as I kind of just mentioned, uh, one of the things we've been really hard at work on is adding additional analytes to both of these platforms and single cells obviously further along having been more established here. Um, and, uh, but not just adding these analytes in uh, different assays, but adding them in uh, combination uh, assays. And, you know, just to highlight, I think one example of where uh, this, um, the power of this starts to show, um, this is a data set taken from, uh, that we produced on our Multium product, which allows you to do um, single cell ATAC and gene expression at the same time. Uh, so this is a flash frozen lymph node tumor um, from a patient that was diagnosed with diffuse small lymphocytic lymphoma. And there's about 14,000 cells um, paired ATAC and gene expression data. Um, and what you're seeing on the right-hand side is the uh, UMAP projection of the clusters. Uh, on both the gene expression space and the ATAC space. Uh, and uh, we can use kind of known cell uh, markers on the gene expression space uh, to label the clusters on the um, top right and then carry that through because of the you know, direct cell to cell linkage into the ATAC space. Um, but you know, where you start to see the power of um, really having this data linked at the single cell level and not just being able to split a, um, a sample 
uh, and run that sample on two different assays is where you can start um, building out correlations um, at that uh, single cell level and using the power of having many different cells to power those um, kinds of uh, uh, computations. Uh, so this is just one example taken from that where you're looking at the PAX-5 gene and you're seeing the uh, kind of in the middle on the bottom uh, chromatin uh, accessibility uh, plots across different cell types and you're seeing you know a number of regions here that are preferentially uh, accessible in um, uh, in B cells, but in particular in the tumor B cells and, and tumor uh, cycling B cells. And on the top here, what you're actually seeing is um, what we call our linkage plot, which actually uses the correlation across all the different cells to look for um, regions where there's a correlation between two features, in this case, a correlation between the chromatin accessibility and the gene expression. And you're seeing, uh, in this case, there's a number of these, but there's in particular, a kind of auto-regulatory linkage that's, that seems to be there um, between this region and the gene itself. And when you actually look uh, in the literature, you can actually see kind of annotation of super enhancers kind of overlapping these regions. And so, you know, in some sense, it's a very simple kind of computation, but it really starts to show you the power that you get from having that rich data, multimodal data at the single cell level and being able to power that with um, uh, large numbers of cells. <clears throat> So I wanna talk a little bit about some of the capabilities we've just released and that we have coming up uh, on the single cell side. So um, we have a number of new capabilities uh, that we announced would be coming uh, earlier this year. A few of these uh, are already out uh, and a few uh, are coming out over the, the coming months. Uh, two I'll just talk about briefly are the Chromium X, which is a new instrument and uh, consumables and software for doing um, much larger scale single cell studies. Uh, and then uh, something that I think um, uh, Fabian hopefully will be excited about as he's done some of the foundational work in this field, uh, barcode enabled antigen uh, mapping. So the Chromium X, as I mentioned, is, is um, you know, really a, a new way to go up from, uh, up in cell throughput, uh, uh, and get to kind of hundreds of thousands to uh, a million cells uh, per single uh, kind of run of the instrument. Uh, so this instrument runs all the standard existing standard throughput and uh, low throughput assays, but also runs now two high throughput assays, one for the single cell gene expression product and one for uh, the immune profiling product. Um, we're you know, really excited about a lot of applications that push you to higher cell numbers. Um, just showing uh, a very little snippet here from one uh, application that we did in-house here, which was a drug screen where we took 48 conditions across a number of different drugs and different time points, used uh, what we call cell plexing, so, uh, or some people call cell hashing, basically uh, to combine all these different conditions and then run many hundreds of thousands of cells in one single run and get the data simultaneously from all those perturbations at that single cell level out in one one experiment. Um, we're really excited about these kind of perturbative experiments, whether that's through small molecules or things like CRISPR perturbations, but also studies where people want to profile rare cell types through large scale immune profiling, uh, or just uh, are looking to power um, their studies through um, much larger numbers of cells. Uh, one of the benefits of this Chromium X is that it's gonna really lower your per cell cost when you're up uh, and running these large cell, large scale experiments, hundreds of thousands to a million cells. Um, something that we really, you know, thought about hard and, and uh, um, paid attention to was matching the data between the high throughput kits and the standard throughput kits so that it would be comparable when you're doing studies and you'd be able to uh, shift between these different throughputs easily. So you're just seeing uh, genes per cell and UMIs per cell, as well as the uh, correlation plots here showing that. And then uh, this is just a very uh, kind of simple demonstration of power. Um, we think there's uh, a lot of other things you can, of course, get from large numbers of cells. But one of the most um, clear things you can get is go deeper into rare cell populations. And this is in the inset here showing some of the rare cell populations and being able to get large numbers of cells as you run that on the high throughput kits, including the hematopoietic stem cells and, and progenitor cells. Um, so, you know, we're really excited about this. This is um, basically out now and, and uh, we're really excited to see 
what uh, everyone can do. I think it was only a few years ago when, you know, doing thousands to 10,000 cells, tens of thousands of cells seemed like uh, it was kind of an enormous scale. And now uh, we kind of expect in a few years doing hundreds of thousands to millions of cells is going to be, um, you know, considered very standard. Um, so switching gears a little bit, uh, a, a capability that we're really excited about is what we're calling BEAM or barcode enabled antigen mapping. And we have two different um, parts of this capability, one for T cells and one for BEAM cells, which we call BEAM T and BEAM ADD. And these are really uh, products that are designed for large scale mapping of not only the uh, paired T and B cell receptors at that single cell level, but also the antigens that they actually recognize and target. Um, so we actually started talking about uh, some of the foundations of this capability a few years ago at AGBT. Um, and this builds on, you know, I think what probably many people in the audience are, are highly familiar with, but it's this uh, VDJ recombination, which is this, you know, really beautiful uh, biological phenomenon that leads to our adaptive uh, immune uh, abilities and, and our ability to recognize almost any arbitrary uh, invader. And in this process, basically T or B cells have all the information uh, needed to encode uh, many different uh, recognition elements, kind of an enormous number, uh, and going through a kind of combinatorial process of uh, recombining those uh, regions uh, and forming two different uh, receptors that each go through that process, the combination of which those two receptors uh, defines the specificity of the antigens that those um, T or B cells recognize. And so this is really why it's critical to get that single cell information because it's actually um, two different genes that you're measuring, the combination of which really defines that receptor. So um, we were really motivated and excited about this problem when a few papers came out a few years ago uh, that um, highlighted that despite the just absolute enormous space of both T and B cell receptors and the antigens they can target, there's actually quite a bit of structure in this data and enough structure, uh, structure in this kind of recognition patterns and enough structure that even with relatively small scale experiments, you could start pulling out interesting uh, motifs and you could start even doing things like designing receptors that have better properties than uh, any of the ones that you discovered. Um, and so we did this experiment uh, in about a week uh, and uh, the data is actually shareable on our website for anyone who's interested, um, where we um, basically uh, took a set of 50 viral antigens and stained those against a large number of T cells. Uh, and uh, looked for uh, antigen uh, TCR mapping. And what we think is incredible and really speaks to the scalability of this technology is in that experiment, we found more interactions across a set of antigens than were actually present in this VDJDB, which is a compilation of all the sequences, including uh, uh, known paired um, uh, interactions between TCRs and antigens. Um, we did a number of analyses to confirm that what you are seeing is in fact real and that there's interesting patterns in here. So one thing is we took uh, one of the peptides from our uh, panel, which is this influenza peptide, and uh, looked for uh, T cell receptors in our data set and in the VDJDB. And we saw that out of the nearly 2000 that we had found, about 70 were actually exact matches to those in TCRDB. This is I think pretty striking because these are completely different uh, individuals that these are uh, taken from. And then you can do something more sophisticated where um, we looked for every one of the T cell receptors in our uh, data set, what was the closest um, in sequence space uh, uh, entry in VDJDB and we're um, quantifying that with this um, uh, metric called TCR dist, which is basically an alignment uh, distance metric. And what you see is, uh, you know, multiple things here. You see examples where there are nearly identical um, uh, sequences uh, here, as well as, um, and apologies, I think these lines are actually wrong here, but uh, you see cases on the left here where there are, these are nearly identical uh, sequences. And they're basically things that were not previously known, but they're very similar with small number of amino acid substitutions to receptors that were previously known. And you have cases where uh, they're basically nearly entirely different from anything that was previously known. So we we're really excited about this capability, but one thing we kind of realized early on is that while the scalability on the single cell side 
uh, is really huge. Um, it, there were still some limitations on actually presenting these antigens and large numbers of these antigens uh, easily. And this is um, in part because they need to be presented uh, in an MHC uh, backbone context. <clears throat> and so we got uh, really excited about this technology that we found at a small company called Tetramer Shop out in Denmark uh, that actually allows you to do something very simple where you have these stabilized MHCs and you can load essentially arbitrary peptides uh, into those MHCs, barcode those, and now uh, easily create uh, very large sets of peptides uh, alongside large sets of T cells and map those interactions. And so that's going to form the basis of this beam T uh, product that I mentioned that will be coming out. <clears throat> now, on the other side, I think we're really excited about uh, this, this parallel arm of beam T, which is beam AB for B cells. And this is really an end to end antibody discovery solution that allows you within days to generate large numbers of antibody leads against uh, known epitopes that you want to screen for. It also allows you to do things not just generate leads against individual epitopes, but do differential analyses and get a lot more subtle data about uh, which epitopes any given uh, B cell is binding. Um, the workflow for this is uh, similar to it is for BMT, basically create barcoded antigens. You stain those against a set of uh, relevant B cells. You sort out B cells that match at least one of those antigens in your panel then run those through the chromium and get the paired B cell receptor information. Data looks something like this. If you can kind of squint your eyes, uh, you get basically the heavy and light chain paired B cell receptors, uh, a bunch of annotation information on them. And then on the left, you can see the kind of feature barcoding counts that are telling you how many times you're seeing uh, one of the variety of antigens in your panel stuck to that um, specific B cell receptor sequence. So to demonstrate the, the power of this, um, we did an experiment. Uh, again, this is relatively simple experiment to five, do. Which, five minutes, Mike. So I can drop absolutely. Uh, relatively simple experiment, uh, relatively uh, simple to do, which really shows you the scalability of this technology. Um, we basically took a set of SARS-CoV-2 antigens, uh, ran these, uh, these are a combination of different parts of the virus, wild type and different mutations, ran these against 100 million PBMCs that were taken from uh, a uh, recovering uh, a patient who had recovered from COVID infection, and we're actually able to find about 2,500 antigen-specific B cell receptors. And within this set are some quite good anti-COVID antibodies, some of which have a very broad uh, spectrum of um, reactivity against the different variants, and some of them have specific activity. And within this set are actually a number of the commercially uh, developed uh, anti-COVID antibodies. So really excited about this capability. And I think this is also an example of an area where the data is just uh, almost unimaginably rich and uh, you can already pull out a lot with very simple uh, analyses, but we think there's a lot more to do here. So switching gears and in the last five minutes, I'll talk about uh, Visium and Spatial. I think just one thing we're particularly excited about at a high level about Spatial is it offers an opportunity to uh, go back and forth between uh, two modalities of data, the imaging data, which has historically been extremely important for um, a lot of clinical work and where a lot of pathology is uh, still done, and then molecular data, which you're seeing here demonstrated on the right with um, clustering, but where each of these clustering, just like it is in single cell, is now being driven by about 20,000 measurements in each one of these uh, spots. I think this is an, going to be powerful both for um, uh, bringing molecular data uh, onto a number of clinical applications, but also just the combination of these two rich data modalities and all the algorithms and methods you can build and insights you can get from them are going to be really powerful. So I'll talk about two things. One is Visium for FFPE, which uh, like Visium allows you to do discovery scale uh, spatial analyses. So basically you can look at an entire tissue, no reason to go for specific ROIs, and you can look at uh, the whole transcriptome, 20,000 genes at once but now do so in FFP. And then I'll very briefly talk about Visium HD. So uh, I'll just show a few plots from an FFPE, a Visium FFP data set from prostate cancer sample. Again, one of the powerful things you can do is because you have the image um, uh, from the exact same tissue section that you have the molecular data, you can go and do uh, arbitrary annotations. Here we've had a pathologist annotate this cancer and uh, in particular, mark in yellow, the area of invasive carcinoma, as well as uh, things like immune cells, uh, et cetera, throughout the tissue. 
You can also do this other analysis where you go purely from the molecular data and cluster as you would in single cells and single cell data and now take the clusters and paint them back onto the spatial locations using the spatial barcode. If you do something simple here and just force two clusters, you'll see that you actually recover something that looks very much like the region that was annotated by the pathologist as the invasive carcinoma. And now you can do things, uh, pretty simple analyses, but that are already pretty powerful. So you can do things like different differential expression where you start from either the cluster or an annotation of the image and look for genes that are upregulated in one region versus another. Here you can see that the third most upregulated gene uh, in the uh, cluster that's overlapping invasive carcinoma is CRISP-3. And you, know, you can look in the literature for that and see that that actually overlaps a, a known prostate cancer uh, driver. But you can also do you know, slightly more sophisticated analysis that we have built into our software here where you're doing something like not just doing differential expression, but discovering genes that themselves are uh, spatially differentially regulated. So we have this metric called Moran's eye, which is basically a metric that um, uh, measures how differentially expressed a gene is over the spatial uh, extent of a tissue. And again, you can identify genes such as this KLK2 that is a known uh, cancer driver and prostate cancer. Um, so we think these are, even with these simple analyses, you can already do some really powerful things, but there's obviously a lot more sophisticated methods coming. Finally, last couple of slides here. Um, uh, we're really excited about Visium and Visium for FFP. There's a lot, ton of good stuff happening on that, um, but we're also really excited to take that to the next level of resolution. Currently it's at about 55 microns, it's about one to 10 cells uh, per tissue section. And we'll be bringing this to uh, about 2 million spots per tissue section, about five micron resolution. You can see this overlaid on the h &E here and now taken where you're getting molecular data uh, overlaid on top of nuclei stain from FFPE, Visium resolution, and then kind of zooming in, you see the actual Visium HD spots that you would get from a single uh, Visium spot here. So uh, with that, I uh, just want to thank all of you for listening. Also thank everyone back at 10X who uh, made all this uh, work possible and lots of other stuff I didn't get a chance to talk about. Uh, and uh, as Fabian said, we're always hiring and we're always looking for great people. So I'll, <laughs> I'll shamelessly put that plug into the talk as well. And please feel free to reach out on Mike at 10X Genomics if you want to discuss that. And with that, uh, take questions if we have time. Thanks, Mike. That's fantastic. Uh, do you have a Visium HD example already also downloadable looking to look at? Uh, not yet, um, but you know we'll keep everyone updated on that. Yeah, look forward to that. Uh, but really cool how all is going. I'm just going through a few questions. Um, Adit Rahman is asking what accounts for the reduction sequencing costs in the Chromium X. Yeah, so uh, that example was using targeted. So uh, it was yeah, a combination targeted, right? of um, uh, the Chromium X, but also the targeted panels that we previously released. Makes sense. What was the typical size that, I mean, we discussed about it at some point, right? But what's the typical size that you would sort of expect people to go down with in targeted, like tens, hundreds? Yeah, so we have panels that are, um, they're pretty large. They're about 1200 genes. Um, yeah. And then there's the ability to add in additional targets on top of that. We've had some people who have done Kind of purely custom, where you can do kind of hundreds. Uh, we kind of see probably mostly in that hundreds to you know low thousand, probably not tens so much right now. Case, but right. you could remember. Louis uh, Tian is following up on that. If you uh, fear that there might be more many more droplets uh, being generated, and it's actually it's like droplets or doublets. But do you have any statistics about that? So. Um, the HT basically, like when we talk about the, the throughput improvement, it's matched at the, uh, from the standard kits. And that million cells is sort of taking advantage of two things. One, uh, this HT chip, which is just generating many more droplets, many more partitions. So you're getting something out of that. And then also cellplex, which allows you to overload um, any individual droplet and remove doublets. Um, so, you know, be, because of cellplex, you can actually basically drive that doublet rate. Um, substantially back down, um, but also HT has the same kind of much higher throughput at matched equivalent doublet rate. Right, so you just need to match, that makes sense. Um, kind of running out of time, but like super short one, or Aschenberg is asking about this beam T, which is quite impressive by the way. I'm looking forward to looking at it in more detail. Can you make tetromeres with different image CLEs and 
could you make them for one MHC1 and MHC2? It's only MHC1 right now. Um, it is a number of different alleles that Tetramer Shop uh, had developed and, and in principle, we can also develop additional ones. So we'll have, a, uh, we'll, I don't know if we have information up right now, but um, we will have a, a number of different alleles uh, that would be possible to do this with. Thanks, Mike. This was great, exciting, uh, as always, to see where, where things are going. Appreciate the um, presentation. And we should move on to our last speaker, who is Vola Thanks, from... Thanks, Mike. There's like roaring applause, uh, virtually. Um, our last speaker is uh, Louis Woloch, co-founder of Immune AI. And I can briefly uh, tell you about background. Guess where he has been studying doing his master's degree in electric engineering and computer science at MIT again. I do see some type of, of, of bias here. So I, I feel like I'm the diversity German European or something like that. But so, so thanks for the invitation. Um, Louis has then been uh, doing a PhD again at MIT before then going in, in some tech palantir, then uh, particular being co-founder of Immune AI since back three years ago. I'm looking forward to learning about how now Immune AI is leveraging CNS and multi-omics uh, to the machine learning. Great. Thank you very much, Fabian, and uh, thank you as well to the, uh, to the other speakers. It's really exciting to see all this amazing work um, being done all over and uh, excited to share you a little bit about what we're up to. So the agenda for today is as follows. I'll start with uh, introducing uh, Immunai, you know, because uh, just to set the context for our goals. Uh, and then I'll talk about how, uh, you know, we use uh, move to task and transfer learning uh, within immunology for drug discovery, uh, give an overview of some of the technologies that we use, and then a specific use case showing how this all comes together. So uh, a little bit about us. The whole mission of the company, you know, essentially is like believing that uh, we should take a broad approach for understanding the immune system. Uh, and with this broad approach, we'll be able to uncover the complexities and discover better drugs toward an entire array of diseases. For us, this broad approach means leveraging the similarities across many diseases, drug types, and experimental setups that we use. In other words, we can think about it as trying to look at the immune system in a way from, uh, from the top of the tree, meaning many diseases and drug types at once, so that we can understand the similarities between them and understand more patterns than by just looking at them alone. And because of the great complexity um, of all of these systems, uh, this is only possible by leveraging uh, in our, the single cell technologies and machine learning that uh, we'll be discussing today and that we're you know, developing a lot of these technologies as well. Uh, before, just a little bit about us. We are uh, two and a half years old now. Uh, we've uh, about 100 people, have like many partnerships and uh, a team. The, uh, I think in Immunai, we have like world leaders in machine learning, immunology, genomics. You know, on the computational side, we're happy to work all closely with Ul Satij and Regina Barzilai, as well as more recently, you know, the pleasure of um, having uh, Caroline, uh, Jimmy, and also Fabian, who is so recent that we haven't had a chance to, uh, to add to the slide as advisors. And in terms of like full-time employees, we have uh, Mark as our chief business officer, and recently also uh, Jacques Bontrabeau as our chief science officer. And uh, one of the reasons I'm saying this is because, you know, for us, the, we really believe that the, uh, the bottleneck for discovering these next generation of drugs is truly like the, the fusion of, uh, of cutting edge genomics and immunology with the best or like big data infrastructure and machine learning methods to enable these discoveries. But that's another about us. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, what we actually do. So, um, I'll start by uh, just going very quickly over this concept of uh, transfer learning for those that are not familiar with it. And uh, it's best exemplified with its canonical example in computer vision. And there, given a large amount of like, labeled data, a neural network can be trained to detect uh, an object in an image. So the example here is, let's say you're given a very large amount of images of cars and of elephants, then you can train this neural network to predict whether there's a car or uh, or an elephant in the image. And if you're given a large enough um, set of images, uh, then your network will do pretty well, uh, long or short. Um, and the way that these networks work typically is that the early layers of the network, the ones that are closer to the input, they learn these basic shapes and basic patterns of images, while the later parts of the network 
they combine these basic shapes into more complex shapes all the way into an actual classification of the images. So as you progress from input into classification, the, uh, the nodes in that network are learning increasingly more complex combinations of features. And uh, what will happen now is that, let's say that you're given now a small data set in this case. So uh, let's say you're given just a small data set of like chairs. Then if you have not enough images, your network just won't do well. And this concept of uh, transfer learning, or if you put it differently, task learning, the, uh, what you can do is that you can take that network from the previous slide trained on, uh, let's say, tens of millions of images of uh, cars and elephants. And you can almost like copy and paste uh, the, the learnings of that network into this new problem to essentially to bootstrap it. And, uh, and the reason why this works is because there are similarities between these problems. So uh, just like um, it is it was useful to learn these basic shapes for the other problem, it's actually also useful to learn these basic shapes. So if you can transfer all of that knowledge over to the new problem, um, you'll do much better. And, uh, and this is the bottom line, is that when you have tasks that have similar building blocks, you're typically better off uh, actually solving all of them together so that you can share the learnings uh, between them. And uh, we, we're taking this kind of approach toward, uh, toward immunology. And the immune system with its deep interconnection is a great fit for this approach. And its essence, it's composed of these different layers. And this is, of course, just an, uh, an illustration here. Um, this is not sort of an actual uh, feed-forward network. But uh, first, we have genes and protein expression, which uh, we use to learn pathways and uh, regulation between them, and how these genes and pathways come together into the actual uh, like cell types and pathways and so on, all the way through how these, uh, these cells come together into an immune response and a clinical response in a patient. And uh, we can walk through a specific example of you know, how this, uh, this would come into play. For example, for this like, set of genes that's like, like Jack and that one that's shown there, the, um, the expression of these genes play a big role in interferon gamma. And uh, an upregulation of interferon gamma, so as you propagate through the network, causes um, T effector memory cells to proliferate and infiltrate the tumor, which can indeed uh, later, as you continue through the network, uh, cause reduction in tumor burden and eventually clinical response. Uh, and as you can imagine, these genes we highlighted here, they're actually part of multiple pathways. And these pathways in turn, they cause uh, different cell types to behave in different ways. And you don't want to be learning each of these different pathways and cell types independently. And, um, and again, that's you know, like the connection to, um, to uh, the transfer learning and why we're using this kind of approach. Uh, and uh, as another example, we've seen these like similar findings of mechanisms of actions for different, uh, different types of cancer. And uh, specifically for interferon gamma, we've seen that it's predictive of response in like non-small cell lung cancer studies, uh, also internally, uh, as it's confirmed also externally, as well as for uh, metastatic melanoma. And the um, point is that this allows us to build these uh, building blocks uh, and transfer uh, immunological knowledge between different uh, cell types, between different diseases, and between different drug types. Hence, you know, just to, to, sorry, to tie to the original example, like in image classification, where we want to learn as much of the common shapes and geometry as possible in common across the different types. Here, we also want to learn as much of the common immunology as possible in common, since all these different cell types and immune responses to different diseases, they have so much in common. And um, one of the things that you notice uh, here in this, um, in this network is that the early layers of the network are cell level features, while the later ones are system level features. And the fact that we form connect the two is something that we think is like quite unique to our approach and um, where the sample level pathways, they're actually connected to cell level pathways. So I'll go in a bit more into that. Um, and um, yeah. so the, uh, you know, the holy grail, of course, for, for the field is to be able to actually improve results and develop better drugs for, you know, that actually work in patients. And uh, we think about that, you know, mathematically think about it as like a, a function that we're referring to here as like a big F. And for example, we can think of big F as clinical response to, uh, to a CAR T cell. And the big F is uh, very complex, and we don't know what big F is either. 
but we're able to learn both in a data-driven way as well as with uh, you know specific immunological hypothesis these variables of big F that we're referring to here as little f uh, that we believe are at least monotonic uh, or at least monotonic around like its typical values so for example we can have uh, a wide range of like little f's that when we modulate them as variables in the big F, we think will improve clinical response. So for example, in the CAR-T example, we can think of two little f's are um, exhaustion and proliferation of the CAR-T cells, where you typically want to improve proliferation and re reduce uh, exhaustion. And, uh, you know, and that's how sort of like these like two concepts come together, where we use the system level uh, part of the network to identify which variables we want to modulate and then uh, once we identify these little apps, we can think about them in a much more like formal way. And to do that, we actually think about this problem as like a cellular version of gradient descent, essentially, where we want to navigate the space of modulations until finding a point in that space that seems to bring the desired phenotype uh, for these cells. And these modulations can be both uh, you know, uh, CRISPR edits or uh, you know, a, a wide uh, range of other things. And, I think two of the other speakers already like uh, mentioned this kind of approach, but uh, we're also big fans of uh, some of Fabian's work uh, here, and um, where uh, we can start sort of taking like seen perturbations uh, and use that to predict the unseen perturbations uh, for these cell types that help us navigate our experiments. Uh, and uh, in order to do all of the work uh, described here, you can imagine requiring a lot of data. Also, like Michael said, and um, and we're able to couple like this data size and variability in modalities uh, to train these networks. And uh, for this, we use uh, both RNA, surface proteins, uh, this uh, sorry, single cell CRISPR um, guide detections, as well as like chromatin accessibility data. And uh, we have in the, in the team like quite a bit of like know-how uh, from like some of like, the people that actually did this, uh, this work originally as, um, as, as shown here. And we utilize all this data and methods uh, to identify targets uh, that we think will lead to drug candidates. And uh, these drug candidates are run, then run through our validation platform. And uh, they further like, build confidence that these targets that are worthwhile for us to eventually take them to the clinic. And uh, we do these validations both through in vitro screens uh, as well as in vivo work. And, um, yeah, and these are, of course, are all data that eventually will feed back into our platform that can, uh, you know, help identify future targets as well. And uh, with, you know, this very large data set, we're able to, um, uh, to identify for many different diseases and, uh, and find connections between these uh, different diseases as well. So again, like we've made this like commitment early on to, to actually work on multiple diseases at the same time to find these, uh, these connections. And this is another like, great moment to acknowledge that so much of our work is built on top of or motivated by uh, some of the papers listed here, uh, where each of the faces are either like speakers today uh, or you know advisors or, uh, or members of our group. And uh, of course, um, there is a ton of work here that are also built on uh, on, on 10x work that um, uh, that wasn't here. That was done by by Michael's group. So uh, we'll now talk through a specific uh, gene target and example, just to give again a more concrete example for how these uh, all these things come together. Uh, and um, this uh, specific target that we're referring to here as uh, uh, as the IM zero one five four to obfuscate the actual gene name. The way that we got to it was by mining. Uh, our data for genes that pop up in association with a specific phenotype of interest. So you can think about that as one of the little f's that uh, I mentioned before. Uh, and we look through that across a variety of experimental setups that we have. And each of the columns in the, um, uh, or each of the, uh, each of the, of the rows uh, here, uh, they are, they, you can think about them as an actual like neural network trained on that experiment. And we then look for genes that after we do model introspection seem to play a role across various experimental setups. And you can see how uh, um, M0154 uh, pops up in, uh, in a few. And in fact, there's actually 20 times more uh, uh, model introspection evidence than uh, a lot of the other ones there, uh, depending on the metric that we use. And uh, the first thing that we like to do when we find a strong hit is to place it within its regulatory uh, context. And in our group, because we found that a lot of like the public lists of pathways, specifically for like very specific immune things, they aren't um, uh, granular enough. 
uh, we've built a lot of our own data-driven uh, gene regulatory uh, uh, networks, uh, and a lot of it also like inspired um, by some of the work that, uh, that Carolyn um, has done. And the uh, so I'll take a quick uh, detour and into sort of like a specific method that we are using for these uh, regulatory networks that we also think is um, quite cool, which uses uh, this concept of attention, uh, which is uh, an attention is this. Um, Machine learning method became quite popular in um, uh, in, uh, in natural language processing, actually, uh, uh, originally in the transformer architecture. And the um, many of the problems that Imi and I like faces, they often have to do with identifying genes uh, that are related to other genes and understanding what's the regulatory relationship between them, as well as transferring knowledge from experimental data on a small set of genes to predicting that on much larger sets of genes. And uh, this is how uh, our model works. First, we have this regression network that takes in gene expression from a single cell and the feature embedding of a single gene that we designate here as uh, gene I. And the goal there is to predict the expression of gene I. And what happens is that this forces the network to guess which gene is predicting based solely on the embedding, which in turn forces the network to encode characteristics characteristics of each gene that affects uh, that gene's expression. The attention network then simplifies this uh, regression problem by focusing the regression on the subset of genes, uh, which refer here as gene J, uh, that are deemed important to predicting gene I. In other words, this attention network is predicting whether or not the expression of gene J is useful for, pred for uh, predicting gene I. And because only the information uh, the network receives um, for which gene it is predicting, it's contained in the embedding, it must learn an embedding which contains meaningful information about the gene and its similarity to the other genes. Uh, additionally, the, the network provides us with associations between genes, uh, which may not be closed in the embedding as well. And so sort of like as an added bonus, um, but nonetheless have a meaningful association. So for example, two genes uh, are negatively correlated. They might not be placed together uh, in the embedding, but nonetheless, this information is not lost and it's still going to have in the, in the attention values. And going back to uh, IM0154, uh, leveraging these attention-driven networks, we can identify key genes that are associated with phenotypes of interest. So uh, think about it as, uh, as one of the little Fs again. And, um, and we can find here that in, in our networks, this uh, Deron 54 is actually close to a lot of other like known uh, genes uh, in the literature, which first gave us a lot more confidence that this is exactly you not know, the kind of um, the kind of gene that, uh, that we should be tackling, uh, and yet novel. And uh, and and as independent validations, uh, we also saw that it has uh, like sort of like known clinical uh, relevance in uh, in our data. So, for example we saw that uh, the down regulation of that gene uh, is associated with uh, response. Uh, in this case, I think it's a non-small cell lung cancer uh, at baseline. And uh, we also had independent in vitro experiments where like knocking out that gene also increases uh, proliferation. Uh, so again, this is also how um, we go from originally from uh, detecting uh, the gene using machine learning to, uh, again, that was in that, um, heat map where each of the columns was essentially a model uh, to validating that gene uh, using the, uh, and understanding that gene better using these attention driven networks to having these independent validations. Uh, and so you can have like an actual like story around the, what we think is happening. And uh, before I wrap up, I just wanted to showcase uh, some of the other machine learning uh, applications that we have in the, in the company. And um, as you guys know, one of the bigger challenges in single cell so far has been like batch effects uh, that affect the eventual interpretation of the data. And with machine learning, uh, we're able to learn about correlations between gene expression and things, for example, like sample processing uh, wait time. And in, with this understanding, we can connect, we can correct for such effects and allow the data analysis and inter interpretation to be clean of any non-biological or undesired uh, biological um, effects. And uh, we also, of course, use ML like, heavily to create like highly granular and robust annotations. And you know, both of these come together eventually into uh, giving us better targets and more accurate targets. And uh, 
to give an example about the annotations again, this is one uh, evaluation we did a few months ago against different um, sort of like state of the art algorithms. And uh, what we did here is that we were, um, uh, we were looking at T cells uh, and how these T cells, and we know they're T cells because um, uh, they, uh, they had TCRs. Uh, in addition to the other markers, and uh, we saw how many of the other uh, methods you can see here on the left annotated these T cells and uh, as non T cells, and we had uh, and uh, for different for different other sort of misannotations, and we had about sort of like 10x uh, reduction in mistakes. And as another way to validate it, we looked at uh, at, um, at T cell clones, uh, and we know that again uh, because of the TCR and the um, uh, and this is from like longitudinal samples of patients. So let's say you have like two CD4 cells uh, or, or two cells with the same, um, with the same uh, TCR. Then uh, one of the fair assumptions is that one is, uh, whereas they can you know, move from a factor memory to, to center memory, they, sh they won't move from CD4 to CD8. And with our annotation methods, you can see that there is like very little crossover. Um, as you can see on the left side of the right part of the screen, Whereas even with some of the state-of-the-art methods, there's a quite a bit of crossover uh, for uh, for this, giving us a lot of confidence in the uh, in the quality of our annotations, and this uh, you know and these annotations also enable us to um, to find some uh, pretty rare cell types, and uh, these can be less than you know 0.2 or 0.5 percent of cells, and then standard clustering even with multimodal data often don't allow for the classification of these, um, and uh, you know we, we leverage this quite a lot. So. I'll wrap, uh, wrap it up with this um, just in time. And yeah, thank you again for uh, Fabian and then the other speakers for the, for the great talks. Thanks, Luis. This was a tour de force through some of the things that, uh, that, that you guys are doing. I quite, quite like the, the fact that you just openly share some of the approaches and sort of talk about all this. Yeah. I think we really had an interesting time uh, where essentially, you know, some of these things are still being pushed in academic labs. Some of this is sort of going towards companies. Your data is coming from companies at academic labs. Like this thing is sort of getting really fluid. And of course, this is something that's not super new to people in Boston, maybe also in Tel Aviv. But you know, I mean, this is I think really exciting. Um, I think we wanted to, to to stop on time. So, so Luis, you asked me not to do big Q and I'm, I'm happy to go through a whole bunch, of it, but I think. It's okay we close it at that is that okay i i just thank all the speakers of of this two-hour session again um it's great great appreciate people uh and i like the discussion of the audience thanks for participating we'd love to do some more face-to-face -face, uh at some point again i've been saying this for the past two years but i think it's exciting where, where the field is going and that some of these ideas are converging potentially sometimes with different names and some sort of related ideas. Not sure we will have the image net of single cell genomics anytime soon, but I think with all these additional views and what the idea is coming, I think we always will be busy in the future. Um, I, I hope some of you made some good connections uh, listen to interesting things. It would be great to catch up, learn more about it. Um, you have all our speakers here, follow us on Twitter, talk with us via email, LinkedIn, whatever. I think, uh, just need to stay connected in these difficult times and hope to do some face-to-face -face at one of the next upcoming genomics conferences. Thanks again, Louis, for invitation organization. It was great talking to everyone. Bye.